Hello, everyone. I'm David Morris, publisher for Lake Drive Books, and I am very pleased today to be joined by David Gushy and Steve Watson. David is the author of After Evangelicalism and numerous other books. I won't go into a long introduction here, which David, I think, will appreciate. Um, you can certainly find out more about David. Um, and then Steve is... The uh, came alongside us here and produced the After Evangelicalism Group Study Guide, having taught the material in his own church at Reservoir Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Welcome both. We've been talking already this morning a little bit. People will want to know, but it's it just it's just great to be with you and talking about this topic. Thank you, David, and thanks for uh, for publishing Steve's wonderful study guide. And Steve, thank you for that great work. Yeah, of course. Good to be with you guys. Yeah. Well, um, we are here talking about life after evangelicalism. Um, what does that mean? It's a it's a big topic. It's a big question. It's a word that's used so much in so many ways. Um, it's it's a question about language too, in a way, and and the meanings we attach to language. Um, I think very much that evangelicalism and and those who have been in sort of the exodus out of that that nomenclature um have been doing so over a long period of time to be honest um that certainly was the journey for your church steve i believe and that it goes back it dates back quite some time pre-pandemic yeah. uh, pre pre-trump even perhaps um oh. But that I think that's what's really escalated things has been politics in the last, you know, five to eight years. It's been uh, a pan the 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 fallout of the pandemic. Um, it's been the um, you know racial issues, particularly with the uh, death of George Floyd. Um, it's been the continued conversation around the queer community and what's going on with churches and denominations. Um, David, you talk about evangelicalism as a maze. That's why this book has such a provocative, evocative cover. Um, there are, you know, so many issues with regard to politics and, and the queer community and how we read the Bible and, um, well, you know, you, you just name it, you know, original sin, uh, some of the things that you talk about in the book. Um, maybe if you could reflect, David, briefly on just where do you think we are with regard to post-evangelicalism? You know, this book came out in, in 2020, in the fall of 2020. Um, and we're now in summer of 2023. Uh, we've seen things going on with Southern Baptist Church Convention, which just happened recently. We've seen um, continued conversation in, with regard to the queer community in the church, um, which, you're, which you're particularly dialed into. Um, and then there's just the bigger question of how how are we how is church attendance evolving how are churches doing um, post evangelicalism uh, what what's on what do you think about on a daily basis with regard to um, post evangelicalism? Um, well, I would say one thing that's clear to me is that there is uh, a tremendous hunger for post-evangelical community. Um, and the typical person would be somebody who either converted into or grew up in, in the evangelical subculture in the U.S. or somewhere else in the world, and um, for whatever reason has felt the need to leave or has been pushed out. And they, they're they not done with Jesus, though they may be hanging by a thread. They need other people who have been on that journey to be in church with or to be in conversation with. And um, and I, I would say, <laughs> I said on a podcast last week, throw a rock in any direction in most any community, you'll hit a post-evangelical, right? And I, but I said, please, let me, let me not hesitate to say, don't throw that rock, just use that as, a, as an image, right? So there are post-evangelicals everywhere. Um, they're in the South, they're in the Midwest, they're in the North, they're in the West, they're in the Northeast, they're everywhere. Um, they because the evangelical subculture was so large um the post-evangelical world is is also large um i estimated three years ago that there were 25 million in the u.s i wouldn't be surprised if if it was double that now 
So, so, so people looking for community. Yes. Yeah. yeah. People looking for community and uh, churches either evolving or revolutionizing or being born to meet those needs for community. And there's also an organization, a couple of them, but the one that I'm working most closely with called Post Evangelical Collective that is actually launching in a formal way to try to network and resource and connect these churches. And Steve's involved with that too. Um, so an institutionalization of post-evangelical uh, church life, um, but a lot of fluidity as to what's actually gonna happen. Um, and, but the, the sense that the really conservative hardline Christian types are becoming increasingly radicalized politically and racially and so on, that has only accelerated in the last three years. And so so the refugee, you might say the post-evangelical refugee crisis is accelerating too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's still a sense of uh, aggressive divisiveness going on from the right side of things. And then where do we go from here on the left side of things, if I might characterize it that way? Where are we? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, another thing is that it's not as simple for most post-evangelicals as finding a nice liberal church in town. Like go to a Unitarian church or a really liberal Episcopal church or United Church of Christ. Some post-evangelicals do make that move, but the church cultures are so different. Um, sometimes the doctrines are actually pretty different and the worship styles are different. Um, so you take uh, somebody who's been in um, in a rock and roll evangelical mega church, and they wander into a UCC church in town that has 40 people mainly over the age of 75, that's just not necessarily going to be a fit. They're looking for something that resembles where they've come from in some ways, but also decisively does not resemble <laughs> where they've come from. And that that's going to involve uh, people who come out of that subculture building building these new spaces. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there is sort of this uh, idea that, well, you're not going to be part of this ev conservative evangelical church culture anymore. So then that means you need to flip over to the to a different side. You know, you need to flip over to what, something else that's already existing. But that's not the full answer for a lot of people. Steve, I, let's just stay on this question for a second. You've experienced this on the ground with your church. Um, yeah. What? How would you characterize the you know the the community that you have that hasn't necessarily you know, affiliated with a, with a mainstream liberal church denomination. Yeah. I mean, our church uh, left a, a particular stream of evangelical uh, church network uh, something like nine years ago. So it's, it's been a little while, certainly pre-Trump. Um, and the primary impetus was around that organization's uh, growing rigidity and conservatism around LGBT exclusion. And so we, uh, we quit before getting kicked out essentially. Um, we, uh, I think, you know, for two or three years after that, um, the primary dynamic in our congregation was sort of, you know, settling the water, like seeing who's leaving, who's staying, like who's kind of comfortable making this pathfinding journey, um, still with Jesus, but out of evangelicalism. Um, and externally, you know, being gossiped about a lot. Like we were sort of a lightning rod in the Northeast for the, th the threat that, you know, churches or believers could continue joyfully, you know, following Jesus, but without the... Uh, some of the ideas and, and structures and boundaries of the evangelical world that shifted pretty quickly. And maybe around the time Trump was elected and that the sort of voices of like complaint or gossip, like got quieter, it just seemed less important. And the regional interest from people who are, um, who have been hurt by, as, as David said, pushed out or left evangelicals in different ways, um, wanting places to connect. And so for us, we experienced that as people, you know, again, wanting a church to to be a part of one in a community that has some of the cultural hallmarks of what they liked in an evangelical space, you know, maybe some of the contemporary, the con, uh, contemporary aspect of worship, uh, some of the, the kind of piety or devotional life that evangelical at its best tried to uh, foster. They want to keep, keep some of that while um, sort of leaving the restrictions or rigidity of evangelicalism. And so if we have people drawn to our church for that, we also touch base with a lot of people who need, um, who want a touch point as a leaving evangelicalism, but aren't 
ready to be going to a church. And so we have people like visit us or maybe come for a month or a year and stop or take a course uh, we we offer around unpacking church wounds. And at the end of that, decide that their best next step is to not be a churchgoer at the moment. And so we touch base as a kind of regional post-evangelical church. We end up touching base with people that their next step out of evangelicalism is not church going. Um, they they want to make uh, do some reckoning, make some peace with what they've experienced. And they, they want to be you know, out of a church entirely for a while. So I, you know, I don't have stats or anything. I'm like a local pastor, but my guess would be that most post-evangelical people are not going to a post-evangelical church, right? They're, they're kind of still going to like a soft evangelical church and sort of don't like it, but haven't figured out how to leave or, or they're not going to church at all. Um, so I think this, this conversation and then particularly David's really powerful book, book have a, a lot of audience and a lot of people that want it that, that aren't part of some kind of post-evangelical church or movement, but are, but need these resources. Yeah, that's so interesting. That's so interesting. Thank you for those comments. Let's let's shift gears toward the book a little bit more. Uh, David, I'd like to ask you, why should we talk about these subjects in, in community? Why should we talk about evangelicalism as an invented community? Why should we talk about disagreeing in church? Why should we talk about how we understand the Bible? Why don't we just read the Bible? Um, as a as a scholar, pastor, ethicist, uh, longtime churchgoer, why do you think we should talk about these things and not just move on? It, look, it looks like looking backwards. Um, I intended the book to be a kind of a reckoning with what became I think you could fairly describe at its peak, self-identified evangelicalism became the most significant religious community in America, certainly Protestant religious community, uh, perhaps, you know, the most significant religious community of any type that had a dominant um, cultural, political, social, uh, even economic impact in some ways in terms of the subculture, a, a consumer subculture that was built. Many, 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 many millions of people, whatever they understood religion to be, came through the evangelical subculture. Mm -hmm. um, so, so if 25% of that subculture is leaving, as a pastor... I care because you don't leave something like something that significant without a reason and without probably without some some damages along the way, some wounds and also lots of unanswered questions. In my talks in post evangelical spaces, I every time sense the hunger to understand where they were so that they can make choices as to where they should go. There's an intellectual hunger as well as a spiritual hunger. Mm -hmm. um, there's also psychological harm in some cases. Like I talk about purity culture, which laid a lot of guilt, especially on young women, for every wayward thought of a, of a man in a church setting because of sexuality. Or, I um, mean, talk about the harm for LGBTQ people. I mean, it's just epidemic, right? Um, or people who encountered evangelical, white evangelical racism. So there's a lot of harm. And so, again, to understand, you have to understand where you've come from, process that. And and then if you're going to build something new out of the ashes of the old, you have to wrestle with what the old was um, and say, OK, not this, but that. This is where that wrong turn was. So let's try that instead. Instead of looking at scripture this way, we'll look at it that way. Instead of looking at science this way, we'll look at it that way. I think this is the work of uh church leadership and theology and ethics, which that's my training, um, at a moment of, of uh, religious transition. It's interesting that in the post-evangelical collective meetings, the main thing people are asking me to do so far is to tell the historical journey. Mm. Um, it's almost like trying to agree on the narrative of where we once were if we can agree on a shared history, then maybe we can begin to construct a shared future. Yeah. What would you say about that, Steve? Yeah, um, maybe I'll just amplify that. I mean, I'll, I want to speak maybe personally before speaking as a pastor. I mean, it's, 
I think there's a lot of uh, people and literature uh, or increasing amounts of it exploring what went wrong with evangelicalism. I mean, David Morris, you've probably published some of that literature. <laughs> Wonderful gift. I think I think uh, the uh, David Gushy, you know, your voice in general, and then this book you published in particular, there's a, a kind of singular contribution around the historical and theological depth with which you and clarity with which you tell the story that I have personally experienced kind of liberating, right? So when you're leaving evangelicalism, and my exit was not as, in some ways, um, the stakes were lower than some. I wasn't um, I wasn't told by family members or a former pastor that I might be going to hell if I fought or did such and such. As many people have experienced high-level threats like that. Um, and yet still, there were times 10 to 15 years ago, 10 to 20 years ago, when I was working out kind of without a lot of resources, my own um, journey toward LGBTQ inclusion, like fear, like, am I, um, am I, you know, angering God? Am I, am I not taking the Bible seriously anymore? And if, if that stuff matters to you, which for anyone who has an evangelical formation, this, the stakes for those topics are very high. And, uh, and to have people help, help explain, like, actually, there's a particular, a particular corner of American Christianity, a particular branding story, a particular historical story, um, of people that maybe sometimes have claimed like they represent either all true Christianity or all Orthodox Christianity. Um, but really that's like a niche in the Christian story. Um, and the, the kind of the, I guess, historical intellectual clarity of that is I, I personally experienced uh, peace around my growth, evolution, exit change, however you want to call it, I mean, understanding that story uh, intellectually better. Right, because I think within evangelicalism, again, I don't want to paint too proud a bush. This is not every experience, certainly not what every evangelical pastor, institution, leader does. But, but often um, it's stated or implied that if you step outside the fold in your thinking or in or in other ways, um, that you're sort of stepping outside of um, God's approved way of thinking. You're stepping outside of the faith. You're um, so anyway. I think it, the the intellectual hunger makes sense to me, right, for reasons that go beyond. Uh, our intellects. And if you're a leader, what the critics will load on you is you're leading people astray. Right. That's right. You're being, you're being a bad pastor. Right. God, God will judge you. You probably were told that. I've certainly been told that. Um, so people, people need resources for coming to terms, coming to new convictions that they can hold with confidence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, we've been talking about uh, what is the state of post-evangelicalism and, um, you know, why sh people should talk about these subjects and it being a matter of being able to intellectually process the formation, the evangelical spiritual formation so many of us have had in the past and, and sort of be able to envision something set different or something Past or just to move past that or what it is like let's let's name what it was and then maybe we can move forward um and you steve it sounds like you've had programming around this topic at your church that and maybe even informal conversations have broken out at your church that haven't even been part of this particular material but just it's part Absolutely. of what's in, in the fiber of what you're doing yeah um well, what is it like when you formally sit down and and start talking about um, evangelicalism as an invented community, or or how we understand the Bible, um, or or disagreeing in church, or politics, which can be pretty touchy stuff um, amongst a group of people that may even want to talk about it, but how do they actually do that? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, and this speaks to why the. Uh, the book such a important contribution. So I think, uh, yeah, as you said, uh, all, all the above that you said is true, right? Um, our church, I, you know, I don't know, maybe half or more of the people that are part of Reservoir's community, so hundreds, hundreds of folks, are have some sort of post-evangelical story that they um, they're still working out. This this important part of their history. Um, we did, uh, I think, the year the book was published, in, late in that year, whether, whether 2020 and 2021, I don't remember which. We did a um, like a sermon series that I, I preached through for I think five weeks, uh, inspired by the material of the book as our kind of annual, like, you know, what's the church about membership engagement, um, time of year. And then I, I offered a, uh, an online book discussion 
uh, of the group the the following year. Um, I think um, uh, it's really interesting because I think when people talk about this stuff and when I have walked through people reading David's book in particular, it's both threatening and liberating at the same time. Um, and in, in in big ways, both, which is really interesting to have both those things happening at the same time, right? To, to read like, oh, there'd be ways of thinking about sexual ethics that um, that take healthy relationships that take sort of ideas around love and covenant, the Bible and so forth really seriously, but chart a different forth and a different path forward than kind of the shame-based, fear-based, conformity-based um, sexual ethics dominant the evangelical movement, right? That's really liberating for people, right? Or to think, oh, there's ways to think about um, LGBTQ inclusion that, um, that again, that in engage uh, matters of faith really deeply and that take you toward a more loving, inclusive posture as a result. Like that's just that's freeing for people, right? So I think people are just grateful to come across the kind of spiritual and intellectual, you know, material that, that Dave is putting forward for them. At the same time, I think, you know, each time I've been in a, in a certainly a whole church or even a group looking at this material, they're always, um, it, it punches things in people's um, current uh, thinking or faith or in their history um, that's like real important, that can be threatening, right? And so um, there's the, kind of chapters on faith, the stuff about like, what's the nature, who is God and what's the story of Jesus we understand to be true. I mean, right. That's like, that's, that's really important for people. And so it's, um, it's, it can be complicated for people to read that material and have those conversations and have thoughts like was, did someone teach me a bunch of lies and did they mean to do that? Or did they do that by accident? How do I feel about that? Or, um, or can I think something different about Jesus than I was taught? And, Kind of have that still have this still work right for had to, people react to david's chapter on sexual ethics and some think it's too too conservative and others in the same room think it's too liberal right and just and feel like there's stakes attached to it because right there's stories around what their kids are up to or what they're up to or um that you know that they're working out privately as they as they talk about um as they talk about the book with others so I, you know i think that's part of why we did the class at the church to facilitate and enable these conversations part of why you all have the idea to to produce a study guide to just you know give people some help to have these conversations together but um but again the opportunity seems really big it's so liberating but the stakes are really high it's hard for people to do things that are really threatening all by themselves it seems uh, one of the things i hear a lot about churches and pastors these days is very hard to be a pastor in, in today's world i i've heard this more than once from different people and it seems almost as if 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 you want to find your way forward as a leader of a church getting into these conversations even though the stakes are so high is where there's more reward and, yeah. at, le and at least a sense of a sense of a way forward yeah 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 and and speaking so speaking of that and this would be on my last question um in the in the study guide um First off, I want to mention, just from a practical standpoint, you do have a wonderful section on uh, suggested norms for group discussion, which I think really helps what, what you were just talking about. Things yeah. like showing respect, uh, letting people have freedom for their perspectives, uh, being vulnerable, sharing the space, really good topics there, Steve. Thank you. Um, but then each of the five sections um, has... Um, you know, five or six questions for group discussion. But what I want to focus on here, finally, sure. is um, you have a section called Paths Forward with a subtitle saying spiritual practices. And um, so one of the very first ones is is to read Psalm 77, uh, seeking God, seeking help from God while, while in distress. Uh, the poet of Psalm 77 says, I think of God and I moan. Um, Christ, what is it about the state of evangelical Christianity that brings you grief? You so you so you get into that. Um, then you talk about other things like um, I mean that was lament, but how do we have how do we take an approach to the Bible that's more conversational? That's right. Um, what is it like to read the Gospels only? Yeah, David, you've talked about how so much of Christianity is Paul focused, and it tends to be less gospels jesus kingdom focused um and you're trying to your work is partly sh to shift that focus um yes. you talk about 
the proud being humbled and the humbled being exalted, Steve, in, in your paths forward section. And then the quality of qualities of community that encourage you. Like, how do you think of my faith community? Sure. Could you just comment on some of that and, and what your yeah. hope is for that section? Yeah, I would love to. I mean, one of the things for the invitation to write the guide, both of you, it was fun to do that. I was an English teacher before I was a pastor and you learn fast. You probably like discuss something and it doesn't always go well, like helps to have a little structure for discussion for people to all participate and get a good experience out of it. So it was, it was fun to, um, you know, take a stab at that. Um, I would say the path forward, you know, I, I wrote that in the guide as opposed to just discussion questions inspired by the nature of the book and the, the subtitle of the book. And this is a book, not just critiquing um, a, sub, a religious subculture, but but presenting some ideas, some really specific and interesting ideas about ways forward as a Christian, ways forward as a follower of Jesus that might hold on to some of the best people received within that tradition, but but be new new ways forward. And so um, to give people some kind of discussion and devotional angles and materials to work with as they do that felt really important because I think people need that. Um, people who are leaving evangelicalism may have been taught ways to have a spiritual life or a prayer life or to read the Bible um, that the specifics of which they feel betrayed by or the specifics of which aren't giving life or aren't working for them. Like, you know, pray according to this formula or read the Bible with this set of assumptions about what's happening when you read the text. And, and so I think what I've seen as a pastor happen often is that people feel like they give up on those practices or they don't feel like they have a way in toward them. And it can be hard to keep being a person of faith if you don't have like mm. asked to engage for faith formation, like personally or along with others. And, um, you know, no corner of the Christian church and the evangelicals included, like has the market on how to read the Bible, right? Or how to, how to pray or how to think about sex or community, right? These are like, Every part of Christendom has thoughts about this. And um, and so to, to give people some resources, right? I mean, lots of the Bible is written to people in dealing with uh, issues of exile and distress and disappointment in God. And so there's like tons of great biblical material to engage around what happens when you feel like God's let you down or mm -hmm. what you thought was true religion doesn't seem to be true anymore, right? Like, like I don't know, something like a quarter of the Bible is engaging that question very directly. Um, the, the Christian spiritual tradition, I mean, other, not to dog other faiths, like Buddhism, Islam is incredible sort of devotional resource within those faiths, but even within Christianity, there's powerful devotional resources for doing things like evangelicals need to do. Like there's this whole tradition of mystical apophatic spirituality where you're sort of thinking about like, how have words for God failed me? And how do I need to think about like, what is God not before I can commune with the God who really is? And, um, you know, so right for an evangelical to think like, actually, these 16 things I once thought about God all don't seem true anymore. That does not need to empty me of faith though, right? That can be, that can produce space for a newer and deeper faith. So anyway, all to say like some of the recommendations I, of kind of spending some time in scripture or in personal or group spiritual exercises or an attempt to, uh, you know, both to give people some specific uh, ways to engage the content of the book and also to kind of model that they're, can be a rich, robust, and beautiful spiritual life as a follower of Jesus available um, outside of evangelicalism as well. Like you don't need to lose that. I mean, I think it can, uh, me personally, my life as a follower of Jesus has, has deepened and, and broadened in post-evangelicalism. It's gotten much better. So it's an attempt to kind of uh, you know, model and offer that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, the, these practices at the end of each section um, help replace that loss that you've had you can move forward there are these resources and and you've provided a, a beautiful one in in working from david gushy's um after evangelicalism with the study guide steve thank you so much makes me want to go come to your church which we can now see behind you for those watching there was a scene shift here for steve because of technology <laughs> issues but it was fun to see your office with the picture the stylized picture of howard thurman in the background and yeah, now yeah. and now your your worship center there your worship space in in massachusetts yeah i mean thanks david i love reservoir as well but i mean I, it is clear i mean I, david actually mentioned the post evangelical collective and but far beyond that there are beautiful things happening in churches and in living rooms and you know in corners of college campuses like all around the country and the world around people that have have 
lost some form of religious culture or, or church engagement or rigidity or whatever, but but are experimenting with uh, really robust ways forward. And so I think it's actually a really encouraging time to be a post-evangelical. So I agree. Um, yeah, I would just say that you asked originally kind of where we are now. When I was writing, I was sensing a lot of anger, a lot mm -hmm. of woundedness. And I mean, there's still some of that there, obviously, but but as people find their way to hopeful new expressions of community, that's a time of creativity, creativity and hope, not mm -hmm. just anger and wounds. Yeah. Thank you both. So appreciate being together for this time. And I'm sure it'll be very helpful for those who are considering taking a look at this study guide. Thanks, Thank David. You, you and all. everything you do at Lake Drive is a great encouragement and resource to all of us too. Thanks. Awesome. Indeed. Thank you.